point. Point and shoot. Yeah. It's already recording. Well, so look, all right, so boom. First thing, we're at the pavilion. <coughs> this is our gathering space. We put this up because it's kind of hot in the summer and we need a shade structure, right? Uh, this was funded through an organization called the Virginia Outdoor Foundation. I'm only bringing this up because a lot of your organizations or movie partners have access to land, but maybe don't have the capital to do development on their properties. So we uh, applied for funding for a conservation easement mm -hmm. uh, on another property, but that same organization has a grant program. But the conservation easement conversation is really important because if organizations do have access to land or ownership of land, but don't have the money to develop it, they can't put that land under a conservation easement and then get, you know, the tribal uh, development for value in terms of the transaction and retain ownership of that property, especially organizations that are doing farming, ranching, lamping, right? All those, I know those buzzwords for you guys. Uh, but this space right here <laughs> <laughs> is uh, a 20 by 20 uh, uh, shade structure. We had to do a little finagling with the zoning. I mean, because the property is owned by the city, you know, we had to kind of deal with the fact that if you want to do a 20 by 20 structure, you got to go through a bunch of hoops. So instead of doing 20 by 20 contiguous in terms of the, the uh, sh uh, roofing, we put them 20 by 10 and just put them right upon each other. You know, I, I, I tell you about the story of the guy from the zoning office coming with his little tape measure. <laughs> I was like, nah, we're good, bro. This is allowable under the zoning. Um, so yeah, we under here, we have um, seating, you know, tables, you know, we do dinners, we do uh, classes. And we also do outdoor uh, education in terms of culinary arts. Every one of our spaces has some form of culinary, you know, production. You can grow, you can grow the food, farm the table, literally, and cook it right here. So you know, we try to express. Hey, you know, it's, it's one thing to grow the food; yeah. it's another for people to actually, you know, come together to eat, right? So you know, that's a big part of it. Next to it is the free fridge. That's not ours. It's a collaboration with another organization. They, you know, take uh, food waste or not exactly waste, but you know, it's not expired. But the folks that might have had it originally don't want to sell it. They bring all that food and people come and you know do their thing. This is the most important part, though. You might hear about urban agriculture and people kind of look at it like school gardens and community gardens. We're a little bit above that. We're not a community garden. We're literally a production farm. So cold storage is of in supreme importance. And it allows us to not only grow and extend the shelf life of the things that we grow, it also allows us to aggregate produce from farmers across our region, which you know allows us to increase the number of people that participate in our CSA. And then you sell it? Yes. Yes. Yes, we sell it all. Uh, well, our policy is if individuals come to this space and they're hungry, the food is free. Right? But, you know, it's way more than any individual can come and pick. You know, so the bulk of what we do grow, we take, package up, sort into what we call the Black Farmer CSA. It's a hybrid CSA program. Not exactly what you're usually used to seeing. You pay $400 and get weekly distributions of food from the farmer. No, we say it's $35 a week. You pick your frequency. And by weekly, by weekly, monthly, or for the entire season. And, you know, work it how you want to work it. We accept cash, credit card, and uh, SNAP benefits, which allows everybody to participate in the program. Mm -hmm. How many people do you have participating? Uh, we're at about 42 people a week right now. And are they a lot of them weekly, like the return? Or? Yeah, we have, yeah, most, that's a weekly issue. Well, it's, it fluctuates. Everybody's not doing weekly. Some people do bi-weekly, some people do monthly, but we're consistently delivering about 40 something odd shares a week. Was it difficult to get, uh, to be able to accept staff? Not at all. Uh, you know, the USDA has a program uh, for farmers yeah. to be able to accept SNAP, yeah. and so it's pretty kind of it's really straightforward. Of course.
course, if your organization isn't set up, you know, with all of the, you know, right uh, legal structures, it yeah. could be a little bit difficult. But if you have, you know, your nonprofit status or your LLC or for profit or whatever, as long as you have your paperwork in order, it's pretty straightforward. Do you think a lot of people use use that for the CSA, or is that not mm, uh, I would say maybe about a fourth of our subscribers, you know, uh, participate in that. Yeah. Yeah. We hope to grow it. Do you work with local grocery stores at all? Do they support you? Do they fight you? No. So that's a great question. We we really focus on direct to consumer. It's like a big part of our work is uh, uh, making the decision that our work works best when people have an intimate relationship with the farmer. So instead of us selling it to a grocery store, we sell directly to individuals and or clinics, hospitals. And they have a produce prescription program, something to that effect, where they distribute to their clients. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, we would we are interested in the in the grocery store conversation, but we look at our work as more of a uh, uh, direct intervention to the lack of access to healthy food conversation that bypasses the grocery store as like an intermediary for communities access to food, right? It's like we. In that part, right? Yeah. You know, it's like it's a lot cheaper to buy your food directly from the farmer than having to go to the grocery store and buy stuff. Yeah. So let's walk. Show you some stuff. Um, we'll go. Let's go this way, and then we'll just wrap our way around, and we'll end up where we're doing the planting. So first and foremost, um, I got a good reference to the artwork that's here at San Pablo. So you see, we're surrounded by murals, right? integrate art into our social justice effort uh, explicitly as a tool for political education, right? It's great that we grow vegetables and we got the pollinators and we got the bees and we're doing this environmental stewardship stuff, but it's also critical for us to help people understand that this work is part of a arc of justice, right? That this is a narrative that extends beyond our present day. Like, there are people who have dedicated their lives to their rights, to community empowerment, and those individuals often don't get a platform to be talked about. So what we do is we have hired artists, like artists especially from the city of Richmond, to lift up these personalities. So as you look around, you'll see images of Fannie Lou Hamer, right? Or George Washington Carver, or even uh, Asada Shakur, or George Jackson, or Milcar Cabral. All of those individuals are uh, indelible aspects of black civil rights movement, right? But they all have iterations of their work that specifically focus on land as critical for the uh, growth of black communities, right? So we put those up, and when people come, they're like, ooh, cool pictures! And we're like, nah, yeah, cool pictures, but there are stories as to why they relate to this, this, space, this space specifically. And especially when we're dealing with middle schoolers, high schoolers, we're able to integrate that conversation into social studies, into geography, and help them understand like the socio-political aspect of us growing food in the middle of the city. Right. Um, this way, uh, we work a lot uh, with uh, community groups. Uh, our work doesn't work without collaboration. So here, uh, this first uh, piece of green infrastructure, permeable pavers, this is done by a group called Groundwork RVA. These young people uh, literally uh, put in this walkway, it's probably about a fourth of the uh, space. Our goal is to get it wrapped around the entire city. But they designed the walkway, installed it. This allows for water to permeate into the space instead of pooling up. It's a, uh, a, a stormwater management best practice mm -hmm. to install permeable paper. So, you know. Especially you, since you're the low lying ground. Exactly. So the water just uh, infiltrates into the soil instead of pooling up and getting frozen or whatever, or even creating flooding situations. Around the side, this is our fledgling food forest. Uh, it's probably about 30 fruit trees that we planted in that space. Lots of perennial flowers, lots of perennial herbs. We can walk around and uh, you know kind of see what's going on. Um, lots of weed too, but don't get that. <laughs>
spaces as possible in order to keep that from happening. So that's part of the ecosystem services that a space like this uh, allows. On this side, like somebody who volunteered to do the camera work, uh, like you're really crushing it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Isn't that good you angles? Know, like a nice slow pan? It's not your first word. Bees are happy, they plant tons of flowers so that they can help pollinate the fruit trees. I was hoping this would so happen to me today. Fruit, right? <laughs> uh, I don't really harvest the honey. My wife is the beekeeper. She, you know, doesn't like to harvest the honey either. She's like, the bees need the honey. It's not for us, it's for the bees. So we kind of <laughs> let them do their thing. And um, yeah, occasionally, like we have a, uh, probably about 16 suits. So kids can come out, throw the bee suit on. We get to inspect the hive, you know, use the smoker, identify the queen, uncap some honey, the whole experience kind of like, make beekeeping relatable for uh, folks that maybe so have never even seen it. Say it again? Just the one hive? Uh, so these two hives oh, are the yeah. only ones we have. Well, actually, we had we have four, but um, two of the hives failed, so we just you know packed those ones up. So, you know, that's, you know, wow. so, yeah. so is your background, are you a farmer? I, yeah, I, I, I had to accept that appellation. <laughs> yes, I farm. Yeah, I mean, I didn't come from a farming background, though. No. My work, uh, I was uh, an, a volunteer for the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia and met uh, folks uh, that uh, helped catalyze me into doing community activism, right? Uh, I started a festival. So, Happily Natural Day is actually a festival that we do every year. And through the festival, I met black farmers who then kind of took me under the wing and was like, hey, young blood, I love the fact that you're doing this festival, talking about health and things like that, but why are you not talking about where food comes from? And it was kind of like one of those aha moments, like, yeah, I kind of presumed that everybody knows, like, you know, food is growing on a farm, blah, 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 but really, yeah, most people, their relationship with food is like, I go to the grocery store and I go get frozen broccoli, you know, or whatever, whatever, and that's how it goes. So we were really like, all right, maybe we can help. Uh, Bridge that gap. But yeah, I'm a farmer. I grow, I'm, I'm here every day. <laughs> I get to do this all the time. Um, let's go this way. So we also use this space to demonstrate different techniques. So you will see we have raised beds, but we also have in-ground beds. Uh, raised beds, of course, to show these off so that people can understand, yo, you can grow food in many different types of ways, but if you're in a city, you might want to think about using raised beds because of urban contaminants, heavy metals that are inside of the soil. You know, we cap off the existing soil and then put in compost over top so that people don't be uh, uh, exposed to lead or arsenic or asbestos or anything like that that might be pre-existing inside of a cityscape. Um, so these are, uh, we're, we're actually in the fall getting ready to pull a lot of stuff out. So you know, stuff like roots, artichokes, strawberry, carrots, some amaranth, all that stuff is kind of being transitioned out. Uh, we also grow all year round. Uh, we Turmeric, uh, we're also growing ginger, we got uh, some 
Eastern Kang, as well. A couple friends that are from like more uh, tropical regions brought some sugar cane over. Uh, lots of production goes on here. We also automate the watering, so we use solar uh, because we don't have a uh, water line here on this property. So we use rainwater catchment. Um, and occasionally, when there's like high drought situations, we'll use the uh, fire hydrant. We have a backflow preventer and all that stuff to fill up the tanks. So this water is at least once a day for about 30 minutes uh, to keep things alive. Um, and then we got our fire pit, the fire pit for two purposes. But we also burn a lot of the brush that we clear out from the leafy trees or even into the forest because we do have an acre and a half that's in the forest that we're also working with. Uh, that acre and a half is um, planning to be more of a mindfulness hiking situation, really uh, encouraging people to uh, experience forest bathing. The whole idea of like you being in the forest helps reduce your cortisol levels. Like you literally can live longer by spending 30 minutes in the forest on a regular basis. So, you know, as we cut back that back, we take the brush, burn it, we use the, uh, the uh, uh, charred uh, remains of whatever we burn as a mimic for our soil. So we do a lot of biochar. Um, How has the neighborhood accepted everything? Everybody in, into it? Man, it's been beautiful, man. Uh, there's folks. Uh, that live up the street. Like, if they ever see anything that seems sketchy, they got me on the text. So I might get a text like 9 30. Hey, man, there's a bunch of people over there. You might want to come check it out. Uh, you know, after an hour, we'll check it out. Folks come over, pick uh, food from the, from the garden. Um, we're civic association in the neighborhood. You know, they're really excited about it when we first started. Uh, kids come over, they cut through. So, this space very popular skating, right? So they jump down into the culvert and do their thing uh, back there. But there's also this, this culvert is paved about two miles up this way. There's like two or three apartment complexes that it cuts through. And it goes all the way down to another park, which is on the other side of Forest Hill uh, and Del Boulevard. So people can literally traverse this culvert. Like, it's like a shortcut. So people come through here all the time. We even got folks that are houseless that, you know, they might come out, camp out for our space. We, I don't have any problem with that. I'm like, yo, you know, if you want to, you need a place to stay, you know, got a tent, just make sure you're inconspicuous, put it in the cut. Uh, one day I came over to the pavilion and they had cunt up the whole pavilion, you know, reorganized everything and wrote us a nice letter saying, hey, thank you for the space. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I love it, you know, <laughs> thank you. It was a great, it was a big, really, really big surprise. And, um, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the issue though with this neighborhood is that uh, these are rentals, you know what I mean? A lot of the uh, homeowners don't actually live, like on this uh, Covington Road, like the, the lady here on the corner lives here, she's been here for years, but the two houses on this side, uh, they pretty much rent on a month to month basis. So, you know, folks might be here for six months, and then they might be gone, but when they're here, they Um, compost, big, big, big deal for us. Hello. Um, Hi. Very big deal for us. Uh, we, we compost. I don't even know the numbers. I got a comrade that pulls in produce from a lot of the local restaurants and food halls. She brings stuff, drops it off. I don't even keep track. You know, I'm a lazy compost. You hear about the guy that do all the turning of the stuff. Um, that ain't me. Now, I didn't do this one. I, I, I don't know. handy, but let me call Katie and see if she does. Okay, let me, yeah, let me text it to you just in case you don't have it. I'll do that right now. Okay. Yep. Okay, bye. So, yeah, we we have a, we do them quarterly. We have an event that we call Peace to the Society. That we just invite, you know, social leaders, social justice leaders, city officials, community members to come and just be in conversation with produce that we grow on all these days as, you know, reinforcing. Uh, but we do rent the space out. We're not necessarily paying, but we ask people, hey, you got to pay for the or pay for the table and the chair to stay in the group. But, you know, uh, it works out for us. Um, over here, we have a
creeks. There's a lot of rocks. So we had to import soil, so that's why our compost is so important. But even the, the quality of the soil that we bring in with compost is not enough. We have to do a lot of amazing soil cleaning, a lot of ingredients that you can get from out of the grocery store, kelp meal, alfalfa meal, those are things that help stimulate uh, we're just pulling out our eggplant, but you can see now we're starting with uh, <coughs> radishes. This thing here. Um, we complain that we don't get out. I complain that we can get past, uh, uh, well, get up to Thanksgiving in terms of these peppers. Uh, we, uh, these have been in place since May. All definitely hot peppers. Carolina Reaper, Ghost Pepper, Habaneros, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the work. <laughs> yeah, we get busy with the hot. I mean, Habaneros, those are our faves, but definitely we go with the Serranos, uh, the Trinidad Scorpions, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of communities that are uh, intercontinental that are really appreciate hot, hot food, so that's a part of our outreach. This side here is um, sorrel, and um, sorrel hibiscus, right? So this side, if you're from like Nigeria, some of that, it's just like probably even a delicious mix with ginger and some sort of sweetener, whether you're doing sugar or agave, it's absolutely delicious. Um, the leaves are also really uh, good. Put out okra. Uh, we're now planting. Uh, we did lettuces. Uh, we planted some more sorrel. We got some uh, Egyptian spinach, some Ugandan peas. My wife went to Uganda for two weeks and smuggled me back some seeds. <laughs> and so you know, we're trying to test out what the uh, uh, nitrogen fixation capacity of like Ugandan peas are here. The benches are a part of the space. Uh, it's important to support the story. The guy was riding down the street one day, saw a guy volunteering. He operates a wood shop up the road. He comes and says, Hey, man, do you want to get some benches? So they picked them up. Yeah, man, no. Definitely take one or two. He came back with like 16 benches. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, man, I just need you to you know, just help me with the uh, material cost. Came out here and built them all in one day. And so now, you know, these benches serve as an opportunity for people to come and chill journal, relax, decompress. So, you know, we kind of look at the furniture as modular. You can move it to the way you want it to be. And, uh, you know, just have some time fun. Um, here, we have more of the design of seeds, uh, herbs that we're putting in. Uh, it's called all the things that we're putting in. and gloomy berry. Gloomy berry is like this little tart berry. It's not exactly like a cherry. It's like a waste wall in a cherry, but it's super sour so, and it's absolutely delicious. Um, rainwater catchment. Right now we're capturing about 2,000 gallons of water at a time from rain uh, from the rainwater catchment system. Uh, two, three of them are, are uh, have solar attached to them. Uh, so what that means is that uh, we capture the water, uh, the solar panel has charged the solar mm -hmm. and This is like amazing. It reduces the amount of work that we have to do. So, you know, imagine hand watering three and a half acres twice three times a week, it's a lot of work. So, uh, drip irrigation is our call to fame. Um, also, landscape fabric, you know, uh, keeping the soil covered uh, to uh, suppress the weeds is really important for us as well. Over here is our blackberries. Blackberry uh, uh, patch. Thornless blackberries. I have to make note of that, you know, because we send the kitties over here. Be like, yo, you know, you might feel like you're high, you know. It's high. Us bugs, 
I'm like, man, go pick some berries. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> go get some raspberries, go get some blackberries. <laughs> banana trees and super hype about the banana tree um you know for a lot of communities you know cooking with banana leaves is like the whole thing so go back to the fact that you got the outdoor kitchen using the banana leaves wrap food and cook food really you know casual to us and um yeah that's it um essentially we're uh working this area here is kind of like our we're trying to figure out what's going to happen over here uh uh, we did some uh, platform wall uh, wall tents at another one of our locations. So the idea is to do a couple of uh, 14 by 16 wall tents and then use those as uh, rental opportunities for folks who come out, rent the uh, wall tent, you know what I mean? And then get a farm to table experience in the space that goes along with that. Yeah? So question. When do you think you'll have the forest part ready again? So, uh... We're taking our time. This is, so the way that it works, we already cut the path through the space, but there's a huge space. It's like a clearing in the middle of it. Um, and so I, I need to get some heavy equipment in there to kind of level it out before I can use it. Uh, I'm expecting maybe by fall of 2024 that we'll have that under control. Right here. Yeah, about a year from now. Um, the ideation is that, you know, A, agroforestry. Right, it's a whole thing. You know, you can grow mushrooms in the forest. You know, you can you know have your goats and your chickens and all that type of stuff in the forest as well. Uh, maybe you might want to grow some ramps or you know uh, a ginseng or maybe some trees. We're more so interested in agritourism aspect of the forest. Like I said, like the forest bathing piece, uh, the, the glamping piece, especially in an urban setting to have a where that's not as easy to find. Right. Like, you could do the off-grid thing, but you're like right up the street from the drugstore, if necessary. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, try to kind of balance it. Like come to a space and then have a place to stay. We're gonna have to spend an exorbitant amount of money for like a long-term stay, for stay for a week. Come to our space. We can teach you what we do, and you can stay inside of the planting. Yeah. Can you talk about the name? Sankofa. Yeah. So Sankofa is a West African uh, sigil uh, symbol that means go back and fetch it. The idea is to look back to your past to pull lessons and to apply those lessons into your present to address the issues that you're experiencing in, in the modern day. So. Um, for us, Sankofa is a verb, right? It's an active process. We, we consider all this stuff that we're doing here as ancient technology, right? This is nothing new, right? While people like to, oh, urban agriculture is innovation. It's like, yo, man, people have been growing food in cities like forever. Like as long as human beings have been organizing around food production. Um, the other aspect of it is like highlighting our ancestors, like the people that have laid blueprints in place for us. and. You know, um, not just African people, like we have Mills of Regina Brave here representing indigenous communities as well, because we're, you know, literally standing on indigenous land. Um, and then some of the stuff is more abstractions, is really to get people to start the process of thinking about, like, how are you showing up in the world? Like, are you being mindful of your thoughts? You know, are you being mindful of the words that you speak? What are you paying attention to? Um, those types of things. Um, so, yeah, same culture. The West African uh, um, idea that we're incorporating into the space. So all the gardens have been built. Actually, no. This is the only one that has like an <laughs> abstraction. You know what I mean? The rest of them are like Brook Road U Farm, like, <laughs> Brook Road, Far Rock Community Garden, McDonald Community Garden. Um, the uh, five acres that we have in Petersburg is called the Petersburg Oasis. Right? 
way. Um, and then we have our greenhouse, which is uh, at a community center, Trinity Family Life. <laughs> this is this is this is more of like, you know, this space kind of serves as like a culmination of all a lot of our ideas. But we wanted to like give it a name that was rooted in like identity. It's specifically this space as a whole. We really called this space forth to be a space that spoke to the cultural reality of Black and Brown people. Right, like you can come to an outdoor space and it will speak specifically to your cultural reality, right? And do some education, but also be an invitation into this world of reconnecting with the land and reconnecting with this nature and being involved in food system work. We see that as a, as a liberation strategy, right? That the control of food, everybody gotta eat, you know? But who's, who you get the food from, right? So the question is that those questions of control and power around food is really critical for us. So like orienting that space, speaking specifically to cultural identity. Yeah, so, um, all right. Y'all ready to get uh, your hands dirty? Yeah. All right, any other questions, thoughts? You know, we'll be around. It's, it's going to be um, all good. And you can cut that off. <laughs> Thank so you. heavy. Yeah. You guys, it's so heavy. Great work, my friend. Like, uh, shake. That's reverse.